So let's make sure this is plugged in. I don't need that for anything. Yeah, but the problem is it creates a resonant sound on the stream. Okay. If it's not connected, it's like... Oh, well, actually... Yeah. Just plug, that here. plug it into a spare. All right. You good. Time to roll. All right, let's do this. I'm Russ Doty. I'm uh, in the Rel BU product management, uh, talking about hardware root of trust today. The presentation that we're going to be going through is uh, jointly developed by myself and uh, Javier Martinez Canellas, um, engineer working, uh, who actually wrote the system that we're going to be <clears throat> talking about today. Uh, unfortunately, he's not able to join us, so you get me for the entire session, uh, not just the exciting bits. So what we'd like to do today is talk about uh, the concept of um, trust and what that means and um, delve into some different aspects of it. So, okay, what, what do we mean by trust? Uh, we're really talking about the system is what it claims to be. So that uh, you know who you're dealing with, um, who the system is, you know things about the system. We know that the, uh, the system and that the data that uh, is on the system have not been modified or corrupted in either way. Uh, incidentally, the only real difference between modification and corruption is corruption is uh, accidental, cosmic radiation and so forth, and that modification may be authorized or may be uh, malicious, but the net results can be the same. A key element is that people who are authorized to have access to the system have to be able to get access to the system, otherwise the system is useless. The counterpoint of that is that unauthorized access has to be presented. and. The reason for worrying about all this stuff is that the results that you get are what they should be. So the uh, I mean, um, really powerful approach to this is to use cryptography to um, address a lot of these concerns. Now, when you start dealing with crypto, one of the things people tend to worry about is uh, the crypto algorithms. Is this uh, algorithm secure? Is this one being compromised? Is, uh, what about, okay, mainstream crypto algorithms are solid and are well understood. And today, the weaknesses are not in the algorithms themselves. The mathematics is uh, sound, the mathematics is strong. Yes, there are changes over time, all this stuff does evolve. But when you're looking at crypto, the absolute last thing that you should be worrying about is the algorithm. Unless, of course, you're doing it yourself. Rule number one of crypto, do not do crypto yourself. Rule number two of crypto, see rule one. If you're using the uh, crypto ship with the system, the algorithms are solid. The next thing that gets a lot of publicity, key length. Yes, key length is important. Key length is a trade-off between execution time and um, resistance to attack. So it's a balance, it changes over time. You've seen the things where uh, we've gone from our RSK's keys of 128 bits to 256 to 512 to 2048. And a lot of the focus today is on 2048 and 4096, which look like they're going to be solid for at least the next several years. So pick a recommended uh, key length and don't worry about it. Move on. What else? Implementation. Yeah, now we're getting into some real concerns. One of the biggest weaknesses today is uh, the implementation. We've seen that. Anyone uh, heard of something called OpenSSH? And you may have seen some uh, information about that over the last couple of years. The algorithms, the current algorithm, the old stuff uh, has been compromised, but the current algorithms uh, inside OpenSSH um, are pretty solid. So we've discovered a number of issues with the implementation of those. Now the thing is that there are teams of people address both um, breaking and fixing the implementation. So a lot of progress has been made there. But um, implementation is a concern. 
sideband attacks. Spectre, meltdown. This one is a very real concern. There have been a whole series of sideband attacks through the uh, history of crypto, ranging from power, attack, uh, power monitoring to timing analysis to uh, the latest um, hardware-based attacks. So sideband attacks are a very real concern and something that you need to uh, keep track of. Now, part of crypto is running the crypto. That's the stuff we've been talking about so far. The other part is feeding the crypto with the keys. So key management and key security is a huge factor. There are multiple ways that keys can be exposed. Now, the first challenge is keys have to be visible to be used. So if you're going to be using uh, crypto, you have to have the crypto key to encrypt or decrypt. So you've got uh, opportunities for key disclosure on disk. If you have uh, the key in a text file, okay, that's probably not the most secure thing you could ever consider doing. Keys, they have to be in memory to be used. Uh, they're going to be transmitted some way to get on the computer in use. And my favorite vulnerability, people. So, and in an insecure environment, your passwords are written down on a yellow sticky and stuck on the monitor. In a secure environment, your keys are written down on a yellow sticky and stuck on the bottom of the keyboard. In a very secure environment, your key, <coughs> passwords are written on a yellow sticky and put in the desk drawer. And in an ultra secure environment, the desk drawer is locked. So when you're dealing with crypto, uh, the, uh, realistically, the biggest exposure to focus on is the people. Well, I was having a uh, breakfast discussion with some of my colleagues and they were um, informing me of the strengths of uh, some of the approaches that were being discussed. And um, to reply to them um, very pointedly, mathematics are strong, people are idiots. So in looking for all this stuff, consider what you need to be worried about. And and the system has decided to cooperate with me. And the system has decided to completely lock up. That's... It's secure. Yes, it is. Uh, the only secure system, the only truly com secure computer system is one that is disconnected from the network, powered down, <laughs> ground up into small pieces, melted into slag, cast into a block of concrete, and dumped into the deepest part of the Marianas Trench. And even then, I'm still not convinced it's absolutely secure. So yes, that's the thing. So, one of the tools that we have for addressing this is to use a hardware root of trust. Uh, software is inherently vulnerable. Hardware, it's not perfect. There's still attacks that can be made on all this stuff, but a hardware root of trust is more secure than um, a software. So starting with a hardware root of trust and layering uh, the software pieces on top of it is a stronger approach. So what is a hardware root of trust? It's a dedicated security processor a specially designed, limited function, special purpose, hardened, isolated uh, piece of hardware and related software designed to do a specific set of things. So it's not a general purpose computer, it's not something that you're going to run a web server on, but it provides some foundational pieces for building the rest of it. So what are some examples of it? Um, credit card, <coughs> chipped credit cards. The chip on a credit card is actually a hardware security module. Very limited, very fixed function, uh, very slow, but it's doing a uh, pretty good job of protecting the financial system. Not perfect, but it's a lot better than we, what we had before. 
YubiKeys. God bless them. It's the only thing that makes the uh, network uh, tolerable today. Uh, High-end hardware security modules such as um, these systems which are used in uh, banking and other systems that provide both security and uh, high transaction rates. And the one we're going to be spending some time on today, the TPM or Trusted Platform Module. All right. TPM, a couple of versions out there. TPM 1.2, which sucks, and TPM 2.0, which sucks less. TPM 1. Yeah, some of us going to suck slightly less. Uh, fair enough, but it, it does make a difference. So TPM has been around for about 12 years now, and TPM 1.2, uh, the way I describe it is billions installed, hundreds used. So we've got an interesting little situation here in that we've got a real security problem. We've got a tool which can address critical bits of that security problem, and no one is using it. So what's, what's going on here? Um, are people idiots? Well, number one, we've already established that. But there are some uh, technical and some business reasons behind that. TPM 1, TPM 1.2, is simply a nightmare to work with to the point that there is one production use of uh, TPM 1.2 chips out there, and that is Microsoft BitLocker. New version, TPM 2.0. Better capabilities, much better capabilities, much more flexible, a lot easier to work with at multiple levels, and TPM 2.0 is the foundation of what we're going to be talking about today. Okay. I just asserted that there are billions, probably tens of billions of TPM chips installed today and they're not being used. This is largely our fault. And uh, by us, I'm speaking to the IT industry because we haven't built useful capabilities on top of the TPM. We've enabled it, we've given people the ability to build stuff, but we've not delivered directly useful capabilities that end users can use to generate business value. Okay. So, if we want TPM 2.0 to actually matter, we need to do a couple of things. One, we need to implement the infrastructure to support it. And in many cases, uh, we pat ourselves on the back and go, job done, next. No, 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 no. The fact that something is possible is a starting point, not a finish point. We need to do something useful with it for people to actually care. Um, I see a number of laptops out here. People on the uh, laptops, is your system disk encrypted? Thank you. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, you're, using, you're using servers, you're using cloud systems. Are those encrypted? And if not, why not? So why do we care about this? One specific example is this turned up about a year ago. So Linux kernel mailing list was down. Yes, I know, the site's backend is hosted on a machine at home which is waiting for someone to enter a Lux passphrase to boot the system after a power failure. Lux is a solid disk encryption system. It works, it's got low overhead, the uh, mathematics behind it are solid. It's pretty good for uh, data volumes, but outside of the laptop and desktop use case, it's a pain because you have to manually enter that bloody Lux password every time you boot the system. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, except for myself, but how many people have 
good luck passwords. You know, the thing that you type in every time you boot your system. Is it long enough? Is it a good password? So uh, if you're supposed to raise your hand, if you've got a solid Lux password on your laptop, I'll admit it. I'm a bad person. I've got a Lux password that is easy to remember and easy to type. It's still reasonably secure. It's a lot better than not having one, but I'm a bad person here. So, what can we do? So we've got some new capabilities that let's say that we've got a server. Let's say that we've got a uh, virtual machine. And let's actually get the correct one here. Which side of the system is it on? So we're booting a system. We're waiting for the Lux passphrase. So let's don't type anything in. Oh, someone just hit escapes, and we're watching the system boot. So just a minute, we've got a Lux encrypted system, and it's booting without anyone entering the password. So is your initial response that there's a bug here and that uh, someone has done a very poor job with security? That's one explanation. Another explanation is that we have started using network-bound disk encryption, MBDE. We have the ability to have the root, um, the pa Lux password for the root and volume provided by an external source in addition to the manual input. And we could be using this either with the classic uh, MBDE implementation of a Tang server, or now we have the root password <coughs> stored in a TPM2 chip and being automatically made available as part of the boot process. So we just saw a system with automatic boot into the um, Lux encrypted system volume going up through a running RHEL 7 system with a uh, user login. Okay. So let's see if I can escape out of here. Why, why is that secure? Because we still have a... Am I hitting the... Uh, I'm hitting the wrong one. Because we still have the Lux password... They got about a 30 second delay on that. No, it's because I can't see on this screen, so I have to try to find it on uh, that screen. We have a Lux password. In fact, since it's not being manually entered, we've actually got a nice, long, secure Lux password that is stored in either... Um, <clears throat> it is accessed through either a Tang server or a TPM2 chip. So there is a Lux password. It is secured there. And this disk will not boot any place else. I take the disk out of the uh, laptop, I take the disk out of the server, I take it any place else, and it won't boot. It's a fully encrypted uh, disk. So we've got uh, Lux protection, we have a long password, and we have uh, automatic boot, but the disk is useless if it's removed from the server, or in the case of MBDE, uh, network if it's removed from the uh, data center. Nathan, Nathaniel. Yeah, it, it's also secure under a lot of other circumstances too. Uh, if you're locked out in BIOS and if you ensure that the boot process can't be unlocked, then basically you can't ever see the data without typing, without authenticating in some way. Yep. So we still have authentication, just a slightly different style of it. Okay, so what does a TPM do for you? Random number generation, hardware based random number generator. So it's got uh, good entropy, and you can get good random numbers out of it. If you've got random numbers, you can get uh, good key generation. And the key generation is entirely inside the TPM. Keys are secured inside the TPM. Keys are not visible outside of the TPM. 
So one of the key things to using this approach is that the keys, the actual keys, are never visible outside of the hardware security module. Yes? Does that, does that mean like even you, the user, who's accessing that never know what they are? So the question was, does that mean that uh, we, the user, never know um, what it is? Um, there's kind of a yes and no for that. Uh, we know, we have to know what the Lux key is, but there is a key encrypting key inside of the um, TPM, and we never know what the key encrypting key is. So we take the Lux um, passphrase, the encrypted version of that, we pass it in to the uh, TPM, and we get the actual um, Lux password back out. There are some other ways of approaching this. You can do key exchange with the TPM, but uh, because of the way Lux works, we're just doing a straight, we have a wrapped um, Lux passphrase that is decrypted and returned back. Nathaniel. Just also to note, um, the TPM by default is not accessible by any user other than root. So you can't actually get any of the passphrases in the, uh, in the chain uh, unless uh, you get root privileges somewhere. So for a typical, just standard user with restricted privileges, no, you can never see the password. So some other things here. Encryption and decryption, slow but uh, secure. It can be used for machine identification. It can be used in integrity measurement and system health attestation. All right. So what's in a TPM? You've got a set of things that we discussed. You have crypto, encryption and decryption engine. You've also got uh, non-volatile and uh, volatile memory. And the volatile memory is, well, OK, keys. We were discussing uh, the keys. So the TPM, particularly TPM 2.0, is designed to support an uh, unlimited number of keys. It does this through a couple of approaches. One is that uh, there is a key hier hierarchy where keys are generated from uh, the seed value and can be regenerated on demand. So basically, if you have um, the seed, which is never available outside of the TPM, and a index into the hierarchy, you can get the keys out. And uh, ordinary keys, which uh, you can think of it as having a <laughs> encrypted key uh, stored outside of the TPM. The encrypted key is passed into the TPM, and then the uh, plain text key is uh, returned. So key point here is that you not only have the ability to uh, generate and store keys inside the TPM, but you have key hierarchies and you have the ability, particularly with TPM2, to have a unlimited number of keys. So this is reducing one of the major limitations of TPM 1.2. Okay, another interesting thing about TPM, uh, carryover from TPM 1, improved in 2, is you have something called the uh, PCRs, Platform Configuration Registers. These are interesting because um, they don't just hold value. Uh, the way they work is uh, you write a value and uh, the value is hashed. And then you cannot update or modify the uh, register directly. You essentially append new information to it, which you take the previous uh, value of the um, PCR, you um, concatenate the new value with it, and then you hash the result. Now, the result of this is that you can store a series of measurements, in fact, a uh, unlimited series of measurements into a single PCR, and be able to essentially replay that tree and validate that um, the one you get from looking at the individual measurements matches the one in the TPM. Uh, we can spend some extra time on that, but let me just uh, jump to the end with this is a very powerful capability for measuring and examining the system because it gives you the ability to look at a lot of different measurement points and store the measurement points in a very small value, and uh, you can then 
check, attest, verifies that nothing has been modified by checking the single final value. So in uh, some ways, it's kind of similar to a hash table where you can have a very complex uh, value that is abstracted in the hash and you do the search and manipulation against the hash. A lot of power and capabilities here, but it takes some quality time to uh, figure out what this means and how it works. Big improvement in uh, TPM2 is that the user space for uh, working with it is much better. So, you got your TPM device driver, and that's more or less where we stopped with TPM 1.2. A huge issue with TPM 1.2 is that it was a single instance, and everyone that wanted to use it was responsible for managing their entire interaction with it. The result of this is that TPM 1.2 systems were extremely difficult to share between applications. So if you had two, three, four applications that wanted to actually use the TPM, they were each responsible for um, everything about that, and it was just a nightmare. This is one of the big things that's addressed in TPM 2.2. 2.0, you've got a resource manager and an access broker, which is basically a mechanism for abstracting the TPM. You have serialized access, so um, you have um, <clears throat> ability to control who accesses it and in what order, and you have uh, some abstraction mechanisms such that uh, the context or the state of each user is carried by that user so that you can have multiple applications interacting with the TPM, each appearing to effectively have sole access to the TPM. This, as much as anything else, is what makes TPM 2.0 actually usable. Now, there's a number of things. There are higher level interfaces that uh, provide higher level functions and make it a uh, more civilized environment. I would actually um, argue it's not so much that it sucks less as that it sucks much less than um, 1.2. So there have been huge improvements in both the functional capabilities and the usability with TPM2. Okay, would anyone be terribly shocked to hear that there's more than one TPM2 software stack? There's actually a couple that we're um, shipping. There is a uh, one originally developed by um, IBM, which was the first available. And then uh, Intel has actually been implementing one. Uh, the Intel version is a implementation of the Trusted Computing Group TCG uh, TPM 2.0 specification. So the argument is that the Intel version is standards compliant and they've only recently released uh, final versions of some of the top layers of the stack. Uh, the reason for mentioning this is that we are focusing on the, um, the Intel stack, which is the uh, TCG compliant stack. So we're supporting the TCG standards, both at the low level uh, TPM uh, module itself, as well as the full software stack, driver, resource manager, up through higher level application interfaces. Now, the magic for the demonstration we saw is network-bound disk encryption, which uses uh, Clevis and Tang. Tang is a network server, and Clevis is a module that is uh, added to the boot path, added to the um, NITRAM, which will interact with several different services. Today, uh, we have... Um, let me see, go through here. The key thing about it is that, and I've got four minutes, so I need to talk even faster. The key thing about this is that um, Clevis handles uh, providing the Lux password. Clevis can use multiple inputs. Two available today are network through the Tang server and TPM2. There are plans to add um, additional uh, sources uh, in the future. So this started out as something pretty simple, and it's re remaining pretty simple, but it is uh, showing some very interesting capabilities. 
encrypt and decrypt from uh, the pins. It uses the uh, Jose um, interface for the crypto pieces. And has anyone here had any experience with a PKI public key um, system? Was it a pleasant and fun-filled experience? Did it uh, give you relaxing days and no problems? Dreams or nightmares? So uh, what's happening is that rather than having a full PKI implementation, the uh, uh, actual Lux passphrase is encrypted and stored in the uh, Lux metadata, and we have access to a variety of tools for decrypting that. It's still managed, but uh, we need to manage the uh, key environment but we don't have to actually provide full public key management of the individual keys. It's a little bit subtle. It's something that uh, causes people concern the first time they run into it, but it actually has a high level of uh, protection, and it completely sidesteps the nightmare that is PKI. So how does it work? Clevis basically takes pinned configuration of data, does the uh, <coughs> encryption, ends up in a key store. On the decryption side, it goes to the key store, does its magic, and provides the key. Using uh, Clevis for Lux, we've got the Lux binding coming down. It can be and stored in either a TPM uh, module or on the network uh, server. And I just lied to you. One of the things that's interesting about Clevis is that it supports policies, and today you can have either TPM or Tang or both. So this gives you some very interesting capabilities. Implementation. We started working with TPM in RHEL 7, TPM 2.0 and RHEL 7.3. Phased implementation. Driver, user space and tech preview, user space in production, and the TPM 2.0 support. In Fedora, we delivered the TPM 2 capabilities in Fedora 27. Fedora 28 has this, and I would encourage you to use it. Okay, what's next? We're looking for other places where hardware root of trust can be used to provide direct customer benefits. We've got some really powerful technology here. Now let's do something bloody useful with it for a change. Uh, yeah, yeah, and we'd like to invite you to help us with that. Uh, looking at some change, possibly using PKCS 11 as a standard interface to um, all the various crypto and um, hardware uh, root of trust. We're looking at addressing the uh, system management and usability pieces. We've got a lot of things that uh, we think can be uh, usefully addressed using these capabilities in a TPM, other hardware root of trust, and uh, the network and um, other system capabilities. And I'd like to do something novel by letting you uh, follow up on this directly. If you have any interest in this, there is an excellent book on the subject, A Practical Guide to 2 p.m., that is so well written, even a product manager can understand it. Not easily, but with enough work. Now, this is interesting because it is available as a hard copy. There is also available um, as an e-book for free. So. Uh, do a search for a practical guide to TPM free ebook, download it, and read it. Trusted Computing Group is behind all of this. Information on the two uh, TSS packages and information on Clevis. And I think I've probably used absolutely all of my time, but we've got a few moments for questions. Actually, uh, next is the coffee break. So we do have some time. So. So I will be happy to uh, address any questions you might have because, for once, I'm not running over on someone else. So very naive question, but how do you check that the API is who you're you, you believe you're talking to? 
Okay. So okay. it's it's one thing to have hardware root of trust, but software root of trust with the API. How do I check that? That is actually one of the uh, key capabilities that can benefit from a hardware root of trust. The basic idea is that uh, you perform a key exchange with your hardware root of trust. The hardware uh, root of trust will generate a public key, private key pair. The private key is never visible outside of the TPM. So if you have the public key, you can do a uh, key exchange with the TPM using the TPM public key and verify that you are in fact talking to that specific TPM. I, I think they gave us the longest room in the entire building. Yes. Yeah, I sat in the back of the room uh, yesterday, and it was impossible to read the slides, so this is much better. Um, so since now you're placing all your trust in the uh, TPM module, um, it, to my understanding, um, those are still uh, all closed firmwares. Do you know if there's any work on uh, free software implementation of TPM? There is. That actually uh, touches on something that um, I didn't mention because it was going down a little bit of a rat hole, but there are three uh, implementations of TPM. Now, TPM is a specification, and it can be implemented in different ways. The ways of implementing it are hardware TPM, which is the hardware module that gets plugged into the server, um, and Finian, Jamalto, a few other people are doing those. Um, I consider these, this the most secure um, implementation, also the slowest. TPM can be implemented in uh, system firmware, and that has been done by uh, Intel, for example, in recent generations of their uh, processor and chipset, that uh, they have a firmware TPM, so there is no uh, external hardware. You can also implement a software TPM which is widely uh, used, well, becoming, it is becoming more available and we hope it will be widely actually used in um, hypervisors where you have a software TPM as part of the hypervisor environment, um, typically as part of QEMU or the equivalent. And um, I believe there are uh, plans to uh, provide uh, TPM 2.0 implementation in future versions of QEMU. And this is a software implementation which you can examine the whole thing. It does not have the hardening that you get from a hardware implementation, but it is a implementation of uh, TPM that you can examine. Now, I'm not sure what the, uh, the underlying concerns are, whether you're concerned about uh, secret leakage or you're concerned about uh, correct operation. If you're uh, concerned about correct operation, you can do things like do operations against a hardware TPM, firmware TPM, and the known uh, software TPM and see if they give you the same results, which, okay, that can be useful. Um, not trusting the hardware vendor for secret leakage, yeah, that's a concern. Yeah, I mean, m my concern was more specifically about the TPM being an embedded device in your system that, you know, you don't really know what it's doing, and, and if you can't audit the firmware on it, then, you know, how do you actually really trust it? It is a leap of faith. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Now, in this case, I would argue that it is a justifiable leap, leap of faith because you have people that are building their business on uh, building and shipping these chips. These chips are being attacked day in, day out. And if there are weaknesses, either um, accidental or deliberate, it impacts their business. And this is a small constrained environment. I'm actually much more concerned about the uh, host CPU, but I acknowledge, yes, valid concern. Nathaniel, you, did you? I wanted to answer that question. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, it's, it's, it's actually not true. Microphone. Yeah. 
So it's actually not true that you have to put all of your trust in the TPM. Uh, Clevis does uh, have policies for doing crypto, and the way that you combine the various different pins is with a pin called Shamir Secret Sharing, which actually allows you to fragment the key uh, using a, a polynomial, and so the degree of the polynomial is the threshold for how they're combined. Uh, the unique feature of this algorithm, of course, is that if there is a compromise to one of the fragments, you learn nothing about the actual uh, root key that it's been divided, right? So uh, if you were to combine TPM with some other policy and your TPM is completely lying to you or completely compromised in some way, then there's actually no nothing gained from that. So, uh, so uh, Clevis does give you some protections for that. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that. Just quick follow-up on that on the TPM secret sharing thing, uh, we're working with a researcher in Brno uh, named Petr Svenda. If anybody's here from Brno, you probably know him, um, who has done secret sharing across large numbers of smart cards. So, for example, you can take 100 smart cards and secret share a key across all of them, and the likelihood of being able to break that key goes down with, you, with every additional smart card you add. So there's lots of interesting things you can do uh, with multi-party computing and, and TPMs to make them easier and, to trust. Uh, absolutely. And note, incidentally, that uh, Clevis has a policy engine and is pluggable, and as mentioned, supports the uh, Shamir Shared Secrets, which means that uh, this is actually a surprisingly simple uh, starting point, which has a lot of characteristics that aren't immediately obvious. Uh, we're going to have fun the next few years, and I, I, we're going to be doing some things that actually make a difference for our users and our customers. Uh, all right, so right now we have a coffee break downstairs in the lounge. Uh, so if you have any other questions or want to talk to the speaker, um, you can probably find him down there. Absolutely. Uh, so thank you to the speaker. Thank you. And also, uh, there is a party tonight. Uh, it's going to be the most fun party ever, uh, according to the fun committee. Uh, uh, and so I think... If you don't have tickets, you can get them at registration. Um, so quote me on that, and if they don't have it, then come back to me. Yeah, thank you. I think you didn't ask me to cover my question. Okay. Well, my concern was, what if there's an API that intercepts the data and stores it somewhere for one or two somewhere else? Some sort of